Welcome to the module on a brief history of the web. In this module, we'll just take a kind of a brief overview of some of the technologies involved with the web. We won't get into all the details, but it'll give you some background on how it works. The three technology breakthroughs that made the web possible were first TCP IP. TCP IP was the integrating network technology that just made the network so all the computers could communicate with each other. Beyond that, Web 1.0 technologies are the first web pages H, uh, used HTTP and HTML standards to send web pages across those networks and uh, define how those pages were written and displayed in a browser. Web 2.0, the extended technologies, are the technologies we probably are most familiar with today that kind of make the web come alive. They are the things that allow for video and for stores to work and for stores to show you the correct inventory of products and for the store site to communicate with the uh, delivery sites to tell you when your package will be delivered. So let's look at those in a little more detail. Uh, TCP IP is really uh, goes back quite a ways. It, the idea for TCP IP was hatched in the 1960s by DARPA. Uh, DARPA was interested in this because computers were networked locally, like within a building or within an agency. But computers had a really tough time talking with computers in other agencies. There was no way to get the data across. And so TCP IP was really the bridge that went from one network to another network. And that's kind of why it's really evolved so well on the Internet today. Um, let's see. In the 80s, the tech industry started adopting it. So in the 80s, you had companies like... Uh, IBM and Microsoft all writing their own networking standards and uh, but they quickly realized that that's an area where they need to cooperate rather than compete and by the end of the 80s the uh, tech industry kind of consolidated and said hey we'll use TPI, TCP IP. So uh, in the early 90s what you had is that companies would put up their own kind of private networks. You could subscribe to the network and get email, but at first you could only send email to other people within that kind of private service provider. But then in the early 90s, those private providers just kind of faded into the background so that we had an integrated network with everybody using a standards-based TCP IP. So here's an example of TCP IP. I want to I want to kind of show you how messages are sent across networks um, using uh, the addressing spe scheme called IP addresses. So here's Dr. Walsh's computer. He's at home in his home office uh, writing a message here, and he wants to make sure that message gets to the recipient. Okay, well. Dr. Walsh is connected to the internet here you can see and sometimes he sends friend uh, messages to uh, Dr. Mahesh at UNO and you can see uh, sometimes he sends messages to trop rock legend Eric Stone and so those messages have to know how to get to those two different locations and TCP IP does that so let's take a look at a message here's a message let's write a paper and I want to send this to Dr. Mahesh. We'll look at the IP address. Write that I have the IP address of the recipient of my message, and that's how the network will know to send that message to Dr. Mahesh. One of the things you'll notice is when that went across that central internet connection, that internet connection doesn't have to know the ex where all IP addresses goes. It just kind of has to know the hierarchy of that IP address. So see where the UNO node is called 137.30.243x? Well, that means the Internet will send any message that begins with those first three numbers uh, to the UNO node, and the UNO then can forward that message to Dr. Mahesh. So you see the last dot 85 in this case 
is just the local address. Right, and so if I want to um, send a message to Eric, you can see this message is addressed to the 75.125.224.199. And again, that internet node will know to send that to Google based on the first three numbers, but that internet node doesn't really know anything about the 199. It'll just ignore that. And then that message uh, will be sent that way. So this is kind of an oversimplification simplification of how IP addresses and the routing works on the internet, but you can kind of see how the hierarchy involved in those IP address addresses are used to kind of simplify the jobs of the intermediate routers and connections. Now, of course, computers like numbers, so that's not a problem. But people don't really like them. People would rather do things with names like Amazon.com and UNO.edu because that's a lot easier to remember than those funny numbers. Those names are good for people but are bad for computers. So we use domain name resolution to make a conversion of that name that's easy for humans into the IP address that's used by the computers. So for example here, if I want to send this message to islanderic.com, islanderic.com is pretty easy for me to remember, so I'll send that message. But my computer will actually ask the domain name server to convert that to an IP address. So islanderic.com will be sent to the domain name server, and the domain name server will convert that to the appropriate IP address and that IP address will be sent back to my client computer. The message will be updated with the new IP address. And now that message can be routed like it was in our previous example. And so that's basically how the network of the Internet came about. Okay, but that doesn't have, um, and then uh, today a couple of things are happening. Um, the Internet Corporation for Assignment Names and Numbers is today the primary organizing entry. Uh, we have to have a worldwide organizing uh, organization, so uh, keep everything coordinated and working on the same page. The example I just showed you was using IPv4 which, um, as you may, may have heard, is in some ways we are running out of IP addresses and need more. So IPv6, a new extended version of that with many more addresses, is becoming popular. Uh, top level domain names. We uh, began life with .com, .org, and .net, but now we're really expanding on that. The country specific TLDs, or CCTLDs, um, give each country a top-level domain where they can organize how they want within that domain name. And now we're looking at um, generic top-level domain names where you can actually request um, a three-character top-level domain. Okay, so that was all. That's how, that just got the network working. The TCP IP and the domain names just allow the messages from one computer to another computer uh, to be delivered worldwide. Now, the Web 1.0 technologies, this is the web in the 1990s. This is what displays an image on the screen that's useful. Okay, so it works on top of TCP IP. TCP IP is what sends the file. Um, HTTP is a is a protocol we use for the browser to make a request of the web server for a particular file. And then finally, HTML is a primary language of the content in that file, and the browser understands that language so it can display the content on the screen. Uh, HTML was invented in 1990 by Tim Berners-Lee. Little example of that, we have our browser uh, makes an HTTP request to a server, and basically all it says is, may I have a particular file such as index.html? 
sends that message over to the server. Well, how did that message get there? Right, that was our last example on TCP IP made sure that message got there. But the message is, may I have a file? And the server responds, sure, here it is. Sending the file back. In that file that the server sent to the browser is the HTML language describing the content. So you see, this is the basic syntax of the HTML language. You can see the less than and greater than signs um, describe the markup and the different tags of information within the language. Um, you can see the overall document is broken into two main sections, the head and the body. You can see the head tag, the beginning head tag is a less than sign, the word head, and a greater than sign, and the end of the head tag is a less than sign with the slash, the word head, and the greater than sign. So um, this isn't really designed to teach you HTML at this point, but you get kind of a feel for it. HTML is composed of beginning and ending tags, ending tags have the slash, and then the overall document has the structure of the HTML document. Now in the body section you see the content that should be displayed on the web page. So we have a heading there called introduction and under the heading we have a paragraph that says this is how the course goes. Okay, so again the server didn't do anything really except send this file to the browser. Now when our client machine receives it, we view this file with a web browser and the web browser interprets all those codes so that we can see it. So here, if we open the browser window, you can see the word introduction and this is how the course goes. And that's what the HTML code told the browser to display for the person, right? So the HTML codes are for the browser and the browser converts that something to readable by the person. So basically, the, the, uh, when we get to Web 2.0, right, 2.0 is a kind of the more flashy stuff we see today, right, rather than just plain text. So there's two kinds of things that go on in Web 2.0, and the first is plugins. Plugins means, all it means is that the file that the server sent to the browser is not HTML and therefore the browser has to run a program that can read that file format. So for example, when you're looking at Adobe Flash or a video or a PDF file across the web, it's a lot, the HTTP protocol for sending that file from the server to the client is the same. But when the client receives it, the web browser does not understand that file internally. But the web browser does have a place to put in plugins. These are new apps that add into the browser, and those plugins then are called up to run the particular file of the file format. So if, uh, if you have the PDF plugin in your browser and you get a PDF file, the browser just kind of seamlessly opens it up for you. If you don't have the plugin, it might say you need to go look for the plugin for this, or it might just say it doesn't understand the file. The second Web 2.0 technology is server-side scripting. Now with server-side scripting, we're saying that, well, the server is not just kind of a dumb server like it was in the rest of the web, right? In the rest of the web, the server didn't really have much intelligence. It picked up the file from the disk and sent it out to the browser. But now we're saying we have a sophisticated server where that file that's being requested is actually a computer program. And that computer program is run by the server and the output of the computer program is HTML and that HTML is then sent to the browser. And then in the end, the browser doesn't really know the difference if it got the HTML that was a hard-coded file on the server or the server wrote it as a program. 
the reason the uh, server-side scripting is really critical when you get to a, a business level application, right? So if you're if you've got a website that sort of describes your business and what it does and has your contact information, right, the HTML page worked pretty good. But if you're Amazon.com and somebody wants to buy a book from you, you want to make sure the web page you send them has an accurate, up-to-date inventory of that book, right? If you say, if you say, sure, go buy that book and then they try to buy it and you don't have any, uh, then you have an unhappy customer. But if you can say, hey, we have three in stock, that's a lot better information, right? So if a program at the server, the program can run, it can query the inventory database and get the latest inventory level, and then write an HTML page that has all that latest information in it and send that HTML page that's kind of written on the fly back to the browser, then that's where you get up-to-date information and really you can use this for almost anything anything that wants up-to-date information it can be customized by the user that's signed in based on their own needs so you might have you know every user gets a different version of the page uh, or anything that needs uh, a database with up-to-date information so that was really kind of a brief overview of the major components of the internet. TCP IP made the internet really work at the at the ground level getting all the computers to talk to each other. HTTP gave us a protocol for requesting a page from another computer. HTML gives us a language for describing a page that a browser can understand and interpret. And then Web 2.0 is really what makes the web exciting for us today, right, with plugins and server-side scripting that reads and updates databases. So that was just kind of meant to be an overview. Um, I hope that was helpful. Uh, send me any questions you like. Thanks.